a scientist tries to establish when a murder occurred. His only clues are insects collected from the body. Forensic investigators puzzle over a partial skeleton found in a forest. They have two pieces of evidence to work with, a skull and a wasp's nest. In a trash-filled house, detectives find three people dead. Two of the victims are mummified. To solve the bizarre case, investigators rely on dead beetles. Insects may be the only witnesses to a crime, but bugs tell no tales. Or do they? To solve a murder, investigators often must unravel a tangled web of clues. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. Sun-kissed Hawaii is a vacationer's dream. Sand, surf, and balmy temperatures lure tourists by the thousands. But life in paradise can have a seamier side. In late December 1989, a search team scoured the forest near a small town on the island of Oahu. They were looking for clues in the disappearance of 32-year-old Roxanne Tandall. Family members were concerned because Roxanne hadn't shown up for work and no one had heard from her in days. Detectives Andrew Glushenko, Joe Self, and Rufus Kaukani received the call that she was missing. Relatives told police this wasn't Roxanne's normal behavior. If she was safe, she would have come home or called. They feared something terrible had happened. They were afraid Roxanne may have been killed. Neighbors believed that she had a violent quarrel with estranged husband, Benjamin, shortly before she disappeared. The couple were about to be divorced, with Roxanne gaining custody of their two sons. Neighbors heard loud noises and several thumps coming from Tandall's house. Suspicion quickly fell on Benjamin Tandall. Although Benjamin had appeared in person to report Roxanne's disappearance, Detective Kaukani thought Tandall's subsequent behavior was odd. What was kind of uh, suspicious about the report that was made by the husband at the Kahuku police station is that the officer asked for an identification, a photograph of her, so they could you know, pass it around. Instead of taking a photograph and taking it back to the station, he picked up clothes and he went to Wailua, which is probably another 20 miles, 15 miles away, to wash clothes. And that's kind of not indicative of somebody who's caring and concerned about a missing person. All right, Dave. Suspicious that like foul play might be involved, police obtained a warrant and searched Roxanne's home. If Roxanne was alive, well, perhaps they could find we some clues to help locate her. Kitchen or the bathroom, Dave. If Benjamin had kidnapped or killed her, they needed evidence okay, to prove it. Investigators brought with them a Luma light, a device that makes blood and fingerprints visible. The operator's goggles cut through the glare of the bright blue light so he can pick out clues that would otherwise go unnoticed. 
the light revealed a fine mist of blood droplets on Roxanne's ironing board and in her bedroom. I'd see those smears, yeah, just like we thought. The search for a missing person suddenly became a murder investigation. Um, anytime you have a surface with some blood on it and you hit it with, with, a, with a heavy force, it's going to fly out and spatter. And the harder that you hit it, the more force that you use, the finer that the spatter will be. Where was Roxanne Tandall's body? Prosecutors needed it to build a strong case. Without it, her killer would likely go free. Detectives raced against time. In Hawaii's tropical heat and humidity, corpses decay rapidly. Telltale clues can be lost. Evidence tying Roxanne's death to her killer could disappear entirely. A major break in the case came on New Year's Eve 1989, two weeks after Roxanne's disappearance. Hey guys, I think I found something over here. Searchers found the body of a human female. She had been wrapped in two blankets, both tied securely by fabric strips. Marks on the body suggested she was strangled and hit forcefully on the head. We found our victim, she's about a quarter of a mile south. Although her face was blackened and her body swollen, family members recognized the remains as Roxanne's. It's gonna be about 5.30. When investigators opened the blankets, flies emerged. Examiner and our forensics team to our location. Hi, right, guys. The next morning, detectives called University of Hawaii entomologist Lee Goff, one of the most respected insect scientists in the United States. How are you, Dr. Goff? Hey. Detective Glushenko. This is Detective Rufus Kalkani. He's a Hi, Doc. Nice to meet you. Like it or not, insects are mankind's constant companions, thriving alongside us throughout our lives and well afterward. As a forensic consultant, Goff turns the abundance of insects to his advantage. His specialty is using bugs as a kind of biological stopwatch. If detectives hoped to tie this murder to Benjamin Tandall or to anyone else, they needed to get some answers from the bugs. Give them a chance to come back in and start feeling comfortable. Okay. Goff would act as their interpreter. Really, when you're dealing with insects, you're looking at the largest group of animals that are on the face of the earth, the largest single group, a conservative estimate, very conservative would give you three quarters of a million described species. And in reality, I think it's probably much closer to a million. Insects compete with us for food and shelter. At death, we may actually become their food and shelter. That's what Goff counts on. When he arrived at the crime scene, Goff was careful to collect all the insects he could. He snared flying bugs in a net. Others he picked off the body with tweezers. Goff would use the flies to pinpoint when the victim was killed. Because insects live, grow, and die in predictable intervals, their life cycles can be precisely timed out, sometimes down to the hour. And in order to figure out the actual time of death, you have to have as complete a collection as possible of all of the insects that you find on the body. And for each of those insects, then you have to know when they occur on the body and what their, the duration of their life cycle is. If you're working in the early stages of decomposition, say within the first two weeks, what you're really interested in are individual species of flies. In Hawaii's sultry climate, insects thrived on the victim's remains, providing Goff with ample specimens to work with. He 
you look for the most mature uh, specimens that are there, but you try and get a general sampling of everything that's on the body, ex, uh, either on wrappings, clothing, or actually on the surface. Then as the body is removed, you want to look at what's crawling around on the soil underneath the body, because very frequently, especially as decomposition progresses, you find that the center of arthropod activity shifts from the body itself to the kind of interface between the body and the soil. So you'll have a lot of things present there that are very significant in your estimation that aren't going to actually be on the body. Goff studied the samples at his lab at the University of Hawaii. After the female fly lays her eggs on a dead body, larvae soon develop. They're commonly called maggots. They secrete enzymes and spread bacteria, which enable them to consume human tissue. Goff believed that the maggots would tell the tale of the Tandall murder. But would they speak clearly enough to bring a murderer to justice? The life cycle of a fly is closely tied to our own. When a life ends, it's the beginning of a new generation of flies. A dead body is an invaluable source of food for hungry maggots. Flies begin to arrive moments after the host's death. Some unknown chemical from human remains attracts them from up to two miles away. As soon as they arrive, the females lay their eggs in protected areas, natural body openings, wounds, and folds of skin. Generally here in Hawaii, the species we deal with, you're looking about 12 to 18 hours between the time the egg is laid and the egg hatches. Then you have your maggot. The maggots then congregate, and they feed together. They form this mass, and they're going to move through the body together. So in any given mass, because not everybody lays their eggs at the same time, you may have maggots of several different species and quite frequently different age classes. As they mature, maggots pass through five stages that entomologists call instars. From infant to adult takes several days to several weeks, depending on species and environmental conditions. Figure out what species is invading a body at a crime scene, observe the particular stage of its development, and you can trace an insect's short life back to the time of death of its human host. Lee Goff did just that to determine precisely when the victim was murdered. Armed with that information, police could check the alibis of any suspects. The initial analysis showed about ten and a half days of insect activity. I knew it was longer than that. I knew there was a fair amount of literature that would back that up. Goff suspected the tightly wrapped blankets may have delayed the fly's arrival by several days. He realized he would have to fashion an experiment to simulate the same conditions under which the victim's body was discovered. To determine when the victim was killed, Goff relied on a staple of biological research, a dead pig. But to try and pin it down, what I actually did was get a 50-pound pig and duplicate the wrappings and place the animal out in a somewhat similar situation and then determine how long it took for the insects to actually go down and get to the point where they could oviposit on the uh, on the pig. Goff unwrapped the pig periodically to check for signs of fly eggs. Nearly all of the insects collected from the victim's body were either maggots adolescent or adult flies. Although decomposed, it wasn't out long enough to attract many other insect species. After the first couple of weeks, you start running out of flies. And then we have to go into what we call succession. And this works the idea that any insect that feeds on the body is going to change it. And by changing the body, then it makes it attractive to another group of insects and their feeding makes it attractive to yet another group, and so on down the line. During succession, 
entomologists expect to see a more or less orderly transition from one insect species to another as the bugs arrive at a corpse and begin feeding. Depending on the weather, the numbers and types of insects vary. Goff altered the amount of sun, shade, and water on the pig to mimic what may have happened to the victim's corpse. But how long did it take for the first egg-laying flies to arrive? Goff didn't need to wait long for an answer. He observed the first flies on the pig carcass two and a half days after it was left in the open, wrapped and bound. Goff added the time observed during the pig experiment to his initial time of death estimate of 10 and a half days. He was convinced the victim was murdered no fewer than 13 days before her body was discovered on December 31st. Those extra two and a half days made all the difference. Goff's estimate dovetailed almost exactly with the date of the victim's disappearance and the discovery of her body two weeks later on New Year's Eve. Neighbors told investigators they last saw her in the late afternoon of December 17th. She was sitting stiffly in the passenger seat of Benjamin Tandall's pickup truck. Brought in by police for questioning, Benjamin agreed to take a lie detector test. He failed. Then he asked for an attorney. Officers charged Benjamin Tandall with the murder of his wife. As they prepared for trial, the prosecution's case was bolstered by additional evidence. Detectives discovered that one of the blankets used to wrap the victim's body matched a photo of a blanket on a sofa in her home. And the blood stains found in her house during the police search matched her blood type. Benjamin Tandall was tried and convicted for the murder of Roxanne Tandall. On November 24, 1989, he was sentenced to life in prison. By establishing the timetable for the murder, Goff turned scattered clues into hard evidence. Whatever Dr. Goff did helped the case a lot, especially during trial. You have a victim, a female victim, who's missing for two weeks. Her husband is giving a story that uh, she had left to go out to a party, to work, and then afterwards she might have gone out with some friends. You run into the possibility that maybe she was killed a week before the body was found as opposed to two weeks. So I think during the trial, Dr. Goff's testimony supported a lot of the circumstantial evidence that we had against the defendant. Um, as far as um, when she was killed. The bugs had spoken, and their wordless testimony allowed a committed team of investigators to bring a killer to justice. Elsewhere, thousands of miles away in the Tennessee mountains, insects helped identify a missing person. A young man on a walk stumbles upon bones that were picked clean. Nearby, a weathered skull held the clue that would help investigators make sense of the jumbled remains. Eastern Tennessee, nestled in the foothills of the Cumberland Mountains, is famous for its fresh air and small town charm. But the rural location also makes it an ideal place to dispose of murder victims. 
In January 1989, police received a call that a man had discovered a leaf-covered human skeleton. Aside from some bits of tattered cloth and pieces of jewelry, little was left to indicate that this was once a living, breathing person. Police found no identification of any kind, no hints of who the victim might have been. They found no evidence of trauma, yet they suspected foul play. How else would the bones have gotten there? Detectives found little to tell them what happened, except for a dried out wasp's nest, long abandoned by its maker. Would it be enough of a clue? For help with the case, officers of the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation contacted forensic anthropologist William Bass. Bass is an expert at reading human remains. He first established the age and sex of the victim. From the shape and size of the bones, he concluded that the skeleton belonged to a female who was not yet 18 when she died. But the cause of her death remained a mystery. Uh, there were no gunshots in the skull. There were no damage to any of the, of the uh, long bones or the bones of the body. Uh, we did not recover the howoid bone, which is a bone in the neck, and which is one that you get when uh, you, you usually break if you strangle somebody. Although investigators were eager to find out how the girl died, they first tried to determine when she died in the hopes that it might lead to her identity. Boy lives right over here in this house. Where is he now? He went on home. I in the summer, uh, the soft tissue on the body in Tennessee uh, will disappear very rapidly. Uh, you can go from what you and I are now to a complete skeleton only about two weeks in July and August in Tennessee. If you die in the winter, it takes longer. But if you die in the winter, by the following, uh, by the following spring or summer, uh, the brain would have decayed and the cranial vault, which is the inside of the skull, cranial vault would be dry by that time. At the crime scene, Bass looked at the wasp's nest. Knowing when it was made would help them pinpoint the victim's time of death. Wasps need a dry place to build their nests. Bass surmised the skull must have been on the ground for several months before it dried enough to become a suitable home for the insects. So what this tells me is in January when this skull was found, with the wasp nest in it, that individual had been dead and the skull dried the previous summer because this is when this wasp nest at least was, was built. To confirm his findings, Bass contacted forensic entomologist Neil Haskell to help him identify the victim. Haskell consults in criminal investigations all over the U.S. Like all insects, wasps live, breed, and die in predictable patterns. In Tennessee, they begin nest building in late April or May. By summer, the nest bustles with activity. Then, when the colder weather comes, the wasps die back. The cycle starts over again the following spring. Knowing this life cycle of this particular group of wasps enabled us to come up with a minimum time of the year that it took the wasps to build, plus another six to eight months for the skull to become cleaned and, and dry. In order for the queen wasp to have made her home there, the skull must have been completely dried out by spring 1988. Prior to the wasp's arrival, a brigade of egg-laying flies and carrion beetles must have foraged on the body and cleaned the skull late in the summer of 1987. Both Bass and Haskell concluded that the young girl died no later than midsummer 1987. Uh, we coupled the, the developmental time of the wasp plus the normal insects that eat this carrion and came up with an estimate of at least a year and a half prior to finding this uh, the skeletal remains 
that the person probably died. Now that was a minimum time. It could have been a little longer. In reality, it turned out that the, uh, uh, the body had actually been out there since uh, February of, of two years prior to the time we found the, the remain. The wasp nest had given investigators the information they desperately sought. Once they knew how long the girl had been dead, they began their hunt for her identity. They narrowed their search to teenage girls reported missing in 1987. They also took note of the jewelry found near the body. Investigators pulled a report detailing the disappearance of a young girl. In a photograph attached to the report, she wore some of the same jewelry found at the crime scene. The girl's name was Michelle Denise Anderson. She was 15 years old when she disappeared. Denise was last seen at a party on January 9, 1987. When she didn't come home the next day, her mother reported her missing. Until police knew more about her disappearance, they considered Denise a runaway. Investigators had solved only part of the mystery. They knew Denise's name, and because of her age and the condition of the bones, that she was healthy when she died. They are convinced Denise was murdered, but they still don't know how. And no one has ever been charged with her murder. The case remains open. The investigation continues. The stories that bugs tell can fill in the missing pieces of a death investigation. For detectives in an Indianapolis suburb, insects would provide the only leads to three bizarre and puzzling deaths. Counted in the trillions, insects vastly outnumber any other creatures on Earth. Florida tropical biologist James Kastner has been studying bugs for 25 years, and the field is definitely growing. Well, approximately 10 years ago, the estimate of total insect species in the world was maybe two to three million. More recently, there's been work done in the rainforest with fogging the treetops and a canopy, and this has now raised the estimate of total world insect species to 30 to 40 million. Insects usually go unnoticed or are shunned altogether. They're maligned for spreading infection, destroying crops, and otherwise making life miserable. But without carnivorous insects and their appetites, the carcasses of dead animals would remain where they fell until bacteria consumed them. Not everyone finds bugs distasteful. Studying insects and other so-called lower life forms is nothing new. It's just becoming more widely practiced and providing better information. Forensic entomologist Jason Bird believes insects have a lot to teach us. Forensic entomology has been around since uh, 13th century China. Uh, it's been used extensively in uh, Europe and Australia, and it's uh, apparently it's pretty slow to catch on in the United States. Uh, it's really only had its current widespread use since uh, the 1950s, and just within the past, 10 years alone, it has enjoyed a resurgence of popularity. Despite its obvious benefit to criminal investigation, forensic entomology is not a field of study sought out as enthusiastically as medicine or law. The ranks of forensic entomologists are slim. At most, a few dozen insect specialists in the United States regularly assist with murder cases. People see bugs not as partners, but as pests. Unfortunately, most people treat insects as something creepy and something to recoil and be afraid from. And most of this is a cultural prejudice or just not understanding what insects are all about. I think anybody who takes the time to study insects and to learn how they live, 
learn the extremely interesting behaviors that they show, can't help but become interested in them, if not enamored with them. The benefits can be many to those detectives willing to overcome their distaste for bugs. Insects can make or break an investigation. That's the message brought on this day by insect scientist Neil Haskell, who has come to Wilmington, North Carolina. His mission is simple, to introduce law enforcement to the exotic world of bugs and their ability to crack difficult cases. The ultimate goal is to acquaint the law enforcement folks, the crime scene uh, investigators and uh, coroners, medical examiners with the, first of all, the importance of uh, using entomological evidence in uh, death investigations. Second of all, to train those uh, investigators how to collect, recognize and collect uh, the proper specimens and then how to preserve it and how to uh, ship it and uh, uh, transfer, transfer it to a qualified forensic entomologist for uh, evaluation and analysis. Although insects can't communicate in a conventional sense, their behavior on a dead body can speak volumes to those who know how to listen. Haskell uses dead pigs as stand-ins for dead humans when teaching police officers and evidence technicians the finer points of forensic entomology. In his training sessions, Haskell tries to simulate the real world as best he can. He arranges the pigs as one might find a dead human, covered by brush, hidden out of sight. These pigs have been put out uh, to attract the carrion insects that are forever present in, uh, in most of our environments. And uh, it has been successful because we, we do know that under these carcasses, uh, we're going to be finding some fly larvae that have infested the, the carcasses. And this is what we would find on uh, human remains that have been out for a period of time. Haskell's class is no place for the squeamish, but the things his pupils see here are no worse than what they're likely to find in a real murder investigation. It's time for their next lesson, collecting maggots. We're collecting some of the maggots as preserved specimens. We're also collecting some of the maggots as live specimens. We uh, had the liver that we're going to be growing them on in, in what we call maggot motels. And today we're using liver, beef liver, and we put 15 or 20, 25 maggots in that and then close it up, place it in this, uh, in this can or container and then allow them to grow, monitor them daily or, or every two days to see how they're doing and then, <clears throat> then we can uh, eventually they'll grow to adults and uh, then we can make positive identification of those specimens. Female flies are the insect's first strike on a corpse. If something dies, they'll find it. When a female arrives on decomposing remains, she goes into an egg-laying frenzy. The maggots are the result of the attraction of the chemical smells that are coming from the body that attract the adult flies in. Now the flies uh, have developed uh, and evolved over uh, uh, centuries to select out this specific, very specific kind of food, the rotting tissues of, of dead animals. Not all the fly offspring will survive. But the mother has given her ravenous young a fighting chance by choosing a ready source of sustenance. We got to come around from the other side. This female will deposit uh, anywhere from oh, 150 to maybe up to 400 eggs in a clutch, uh, seeking out sites of, of protection such as the nose, uh, nasal area, mouth, uh, and eyes. Uh, those eggs will then go through a period of time uh, when they will eventually hatch a few hours to uh, a day or two, depending on temperature. The eggs will hatch into first stage larvae, which will grow and develop for a few more hours and then shed their skin and go through several more changes. As maggots grow, so do their appetites. During their first two stages, they never stop eating. The individual maggots form a large mass that eats and moves as one. And while they're in this maggot mass, 
uh, uh, configuration, uh, temperatures within this mass will <laughs> climb very, very high, uh, 15, even up to 20 degrees centigrade above the normal outside air temperature or ambient temperature. Back in the lab, Haskell examines the mass of maggots. The particular stage and rate of growth of the larvae will provide investigators with a good idea of how long a body has been left in the open. The maggots act as filters. They can be tested for chemicals and drugs they may have picked up from their host. For those of us who know how to listen, insects can be vocal witnesses to the circumstances of a person's death. In November 1987, residents of a middle-class Indianapolis suburb phoned police. They were worried that they hadn't seen their elderly male neighbor for a number of days. He lived there with his invalid sister and aunt. Police arrived at the house. When no one answered, they entered. The house was a complete mess. Investigators found refuse of all sorts in the kitchen. Unwashed dishes, uneaten meals, discarded silverware, and empty packages. Bags of decaying food moldered in the garage. Then police found the homeowner, collapsed on the living room floor, apparently dead for some time. Not certain what they were facing, investigators called for backup. As more detectives arrived, neighbors began to congregate. Nearly every inch of the house was covered with trash. Police wondered what kind of person could live like this. The officers cautiously inspected every room. The search quickly took a bizarre twist. What in this? Gosh. Oh, yeah. Investigators were shocked to find the mummified remains of two women in a pair of back bedrooms. Since the cause of death wasn't readily apparent, police assumed murder. Sergeant Reggie Roney recalls the grisly discovery. We're treating this as a homicide scene because we don't know what has happened here. And uh, my first view of the body is, is there's no body. All that's left is clothing and, and it's kind of like a mummy laying there on the bed. And I look at it and I can see the little skull caps that the older women used to wear and uh, bed sheets and I can tell all the bodily fluids have gone see through the mattress and it's just a skeletal type mummy. The only evidence seemed to be an abundance of bugs, beetles mostly, found on the bodies of both women. Whatever happened here wasn't an ordinary death scene. It would take extraordinary means to sort it all out. Investigators on the scene of the triple deaths faced a double mystery. How did the victims die and how long had they been dead? Autopsies would probably answer the first question, but the second one seemed unsolvable. At the crime scene, detectives meticulously cataloged each piece of evidence, including several dead flies and the dried husks shed by beetles, called cast skins. Each insect type was a valuable clue, but investigators weren't certain how to read the evidence. They also gathered samples of an unusual brown stringy material found near both bodies. Baffled by what they found, they realized they needed the help of a forensic entomologist. 
they called on Neil Haskell. He met members of the Indiana University Medical Center forensic science team at the morgue for an autopsy. Obviously, we had uh, to determine how long these individuals had been there because in the investigation it was important to pinpoint time of death. Obviously, who these, these individuals are, uh, when they died, and, and possibly where they died, and how they died. And so each one of the, the different forensic disciplines uh, was, was providing pieces of that puzzle together. For Haskell, that meant identifying the particular insect species that colonized each of the women's remains. Thank you. And for, uh, Haskell noted a curious difference between the two female mummies. One's face contained most of the original flesh, while the second did not. From the second body, Haskell collected numerous empty puparia, or casings. These, he knew, were left behind by juvenile blowflies as they hatched into adulthood. But the first set of mummified remains was marked only by dead beetles. Why the difference? Haskell knew that decomposing remains almost immediately attract egg-laying female flies. Okay, okay. Judging from the amount of flesh still on the body of one of the mummies, flies seem to have ignored it altogether. Insects are weather dependent. Their development is controlled by the seasons. Haskell suspected that weather had played a role. To gather more evidence, he visited the house where the bodies were discovered. In both bedrooms, he found beetle cast skins. But in one bedroom was an abundance of intact, dead beetles. In that room, he collected specimens of three different species. The blinds had been pulled down. They were down, but behind those blinds, as, as I raised the blinds and searched the room, uh, there were, were uh, a couple hundred uh, adult dried beetles that had, had come from the body and had tried to reach the out of doors and gone to the windows and could get no further and so then he died on the window sills. Haskell was still puzzled by the pencil shaving-like substance found next to the dead beetles on the woman's body. At first, he theorized it was a kind of fungus. Then he remembered that a similar material had been found on a body in Copenhagen, Denmark in 1962. In his laboratory, Haskell put the substance under a microscope. As others had in the Copenhagen case, he identified the substance as beetle feces, excreted by the larvae. The feces is associated with remains that have been mummified for long periods. As detectives continued their search of the home, they found a diary written by the ant. In her last entry, dated October 5, 1977, the ant reported that her health was failing, and so was the health of her niece. Neither, the ant wrote, had long to live. This information helped Haskell with his investigation. He theorized that the ant, whose remains were more skeletonized than her niece's, must have died when the flies were still active. That would have been no later than autumn. The ant's body had less flesh because the flies arrived during warmer weather, laid their eggs, and their larvae had cleaned the skeleton. Haskell concluded that the ant, the older of the pair, died first in October 1977. The niece likely would have died in late December 1977, or perhaps early January 1978. The niece's body was better preserved because her death came in the coldest part of the year. 
there simply were no egg-laying flies around to be attracted to the chemical signals emanating from her remains. They got up moved in the middle of the night. <laughs> the mystery of when the women died was solved. Other questions persisted. Why were the women kept in the house for 10 years after they died? Police could only speculate on the details of their lives. The diary helped fill in some of the missing pieces. The aunt had fallen in the backyard and broken her hip. She could no longer get around. Soon after the aunt was injured, her niece also broke her hip. The man looked after both women around the clock as their health continued to fail. After his aunt died, the man decided to keep her in the house rather than alert anyone to her passing. Shortly after, his sister died. He decided to keep her death a secret as well. He managed to maintain the charade for 10 years. To avoid being discovered, he always ordered enough groceries for three people. He refused to allow the delivery person to bring them into the house for fear the smell would be noticed. He insisted that the bags be slipped under the garage door. That explained the sacks of uneaten food rotting in the garage. As the weather warmed, the odors from the bodies surely would have been difficult to live with. To the neighbors, the man was friendly enough but he kept them at arm's length. When asked about the health of his aunt or sister, he'd be noncommittal. Sometimes he'd complain that the women were keeping him up all night or give details of their failing health. Remarkably, the neighbors kept their distance and never set foot in his home. As detectives investigated further, the final piece of the puzzle fell into place. They discovered that the man received at least $140,000 in fraudulent social security checks after the women's deaths. But that may have only been part of the reason. Perhaps the decision to keep the bodies was motivated more by compassion than greed. He had cared for them so long and, and, and you know, looked at them and looked after them 24 hours on a daily, daily basis. Uh, I think that he just probably couldn't bring himself to, to, to uh, uh, give up his, his loved ones. No charges were ever filed in the case of the Indianapolis mummies. The trio's deaths were officially recorded as due to natural causes. Before they died, they named their church as the beneficiary of the estate. The social security money owed to the government was partially paid back by the sale of the property. The bugs had helped detectives solve the curious case of the Indianapolis mummies. However unusual, it was one investigation among hundreds for insect specialists like Neil Haskell. Haskell says that bugs are becoming powerful allies in an age when sophisticated technology is figuring more and more into criminal cases. One example is the analysis of human DNA found in the blood that bugs take from human bodies. The mosquito uh, is feed and it swells up, its abdomen swells, that's a, that's a human blood meal in there. And you can analyze that blood meal uh, for human DNA. And it works in, in uh, mosquitoes, bed bugs, fleas, and lice now. Tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous tool. The study of insects is the study of the great tenacity and variety of life. 
Yet modern science has much to learn about insect life, especially as it applies to investigating death. According to entomologist Lee Goff, many details are still unknown. We need to put uh, forensic entomology on a firmer statistical basis. Uh, right now, the statistical basis is just beginning to be developed, and we need to see more modeling in terms of what's going on with the corpses. So there's an awful lot of research. I think probably I've got more questions now than I had when I got into it 15 years ago. Here we go. As methods improve, as more scientists enter the field and learn more about insect behavior, the value of forensic entomology will grow. Well, when we first started, actually, I'd go back to 15 years ago when I first became involved in forensic entomology. Uh, law enforcement agencies thought we were a little bit nuts and really were a little skeptical that we'd be able to give them anything that would be of use. Over the past 15 years, by working very diligently with the different agencies and different uh, groups of people, we've been able to convince them that, in fact, it is a very powerful uh, tool for use in their investigation. So I'd say now it's uh, very widely accepted. No matter how technical our world becomes, the simplest methods are sometimes the best. And sometimes the least likely sources are the most dependable. Slowly, homicide investigators are beginning to realize the invaluable contributions made by the smallest witnesses to murder.